today's webinar. My name is Brianna Gonzalez. Um, I'm the Assistant Director with the Community Technical Assistance Center, and I'm so happy to welcome you to today's webinar, Helping Students and Parents This School Year. So before we get started, I want to take a, a moment to orient everyone to our WebEx system, uh, this evolving system. Um, so yes, yeah, thank you again um, for dealing with all the technical challenges that happened this morning. But um, we'll go ahead and kind of walk through some of the key features that you should know in order to participate in today's event. So upon joining today's webinar, um, everyone is muted, um, except for the folks that you see on the screen above, um, the panelists of today's event. Um, and this is so that uh, any background noises that may be happening in your setting do not distract others from listening to today's presentation. So with that, the best way to communicate with us is by using the chat box feature. Um, so the chat box feature is on the right-hand side of your screen. If it doesn't appear on that kind of right-hand panel, um, then you can go ahead and click the dialogue bubble or the chat box icon on the bottom right of your screen, um, and that should appear. And we'll be communicating with you via chat box as well. Um, but if you come across any technical issues, whether the slides aren't moving for you or the audio is cutting in and out, feel free to send a chat to CTAC admin host, um, and she'll be able to assist you. Um, we'll also use the chat box today to hear any questions that you have. So feel free to use the chat box to ask questions throughout today's webinar. Um, we'll, in the background, be collecting them, and then we'll save them for the very end of today's presentation. So when you are chatting in, um, you can select all panelists um, as, the, as the recipient of all of your messages, um, specifically those questions that, are, that you have. Um, and today's webinar is going to be recorded, so we will have an archive of today's presentation, and we'll make sure that the slides are available as well. So you'll be able to get those on ctechny.org in two to three business days. Um, lastly, at the end of today's webinar, there will be a brief feedback survey. We'd love to hear your thoughts um, about today's content, as well as anything that, you know, any content that you heard today that may have sparked ideas for something else that CTAC could offer in the future. We'd love to hear that from you as well. So that will pop up for you at the end of today's webinar as well. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to now turn it over to our phenomenal presenter, Rosalia Watkins, <clears throat> to get us started. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. And especially, Thank you for everything you do for our children, our youth, and our families. We have a lot of content today. And you know, when you put education, policy, laws, procedures together with children, youth, and families, it can be a little rocky. So bear with me as we go through this content. And towards the end, we'll be able to pull it all together with some real strategies for you to help the families that you're working with. Next slide, please. So this is our full agenda that we will be covering. Obviously, the chunkiest component is going to meet, be what you need to know about education services and supports. But for me, I always want to remember that we always start with children. We always start with students. We always start with family, no matter what we're doing. So we will be talking about COVID um, responses in the education system and also give you some strategies to prepare to begin. Um, next slide, please. Before we get started, to all of you who suffered loss during COVID, please accept our deepest sympathies. Um, it's important to take a moment just to honor our feelings and our experiences during COVID. And to also reflect on our readiness for this work. Are we ready for this tremendous school year that awaits us. That means confirming your support system and of course it means committing to your own self-care. Next slide please. So this is when we begin to look at students first. And when you look at these experiences, 
one of the things that I want you to be aware of is how many students had food insecurity, unstable housing, trauma from racism, or other things on this list before COVID. COVID added an extra layer for these youth and families. So it's really important as you're acknowledging the experiences of students to think about what was there before COVID and what is there actually now. Next slide, please. The same is true for parents. However, there are some key components here that we really need to be mindful of. Domestic violence is one of those components. Fear of being attacked. When we look at trauma from racism, it's not just the racism that was uncovered by uh, Mr. Floyd or um, some of the other horrific events of 2020, but it's also what happened to the Asian population out West. It's also what happened with the Native American students that we just, just found recently up in Canada. So when we're looking at parents' experiences, there's domestic violence, but there are also new things like fear of being attacked. That may be true for some students as well. But it's important to really take time to acknowledge the experiences of your families. Next slide, please. So what's new this year? A lot. And let me also um, state that I know some of you school may have started already. It, it, it is possible. Um, but for this presentation, we are preparing for the school year. So there will still be information that you can use. And this is uh, really the chunks of what are the most important factors in space. So everyone is screening students. And these are decisions that are being made by districts. They're not being made by the state or anyone else. The districts are making the decision. And when we talk about screening, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's important to note that students are being screened both academically and emotionally. Um, academic planning is being based upon students' strengths, current strengths, and that's something we need to watch out for. We always want schools to pay attention to student strengths, but now after COVID, we also want to be aware of what students may need as a result of their COVID experience. We're going to be talking about multi-tiered systems of supports. MTSS is everywhere. Many of you may already know MTSS through uh, positive behavioral support interventions or response to intervention, but we're going to talk about it broadly because MTSS is going to be used in deciding who's getting which recovery services. Um, and we will talk about what those recovery services look like. Long COVID as a disability, it has been declared not only a disability, but as you'll see, there are some impl implications for using um, the symptoms that children are experiencing to get more services in schools. And yes, remote learning in classrooms like for snow days and things like that. Next slide, please. So as we go through this journey with all of this content, with your awareness of the experiences of the students and families you're working with, I also want to encourage you to just take a moment to think about your students who of their students are having school difficulty? Did they have difficulty before COVID? Who had academic struggles? Who had behavior and mental health difficulties? Which of your students already have 504 plans? Which of your students have IEP programs? And of course, you're going to be getting a whole slew of new students um, who you're just meeting for the first time. 
but think about these cadres of students as we go through the content today so that you will be fully prepared to utilize this information as you begin the school year. Next slide, please. So I'm sure you asked some of these questions to your students. Some of these are very common questions. I'm not suggesting that you use only these questions, and I'm not suggesting that you use these questions right away. When you look at essential knowledge, you look at the kind of knowledge that you get from a question that surprises you, the kind of knowledge that gives you a deeper understanding of that student, the kind of knowledge that is multifaceted. So that's what some of these questions are designed to do, even though some of them are very flat. We all know. If you say, what did you like most about school before COVID? What is going to be the number one answer? Jim, right? Jim, probably. Hopefully, hopefully I'm wrong. I would love to be wrong and have a whole slew of other answers. But be that as it may, it's really important when you're communicating with students to have some of these open-ended and some of these flat questions, but not all at once. You know, I'd say these questions are like saffron a little bit at a time. You don't want to put too much in the pot. Um, I particularly like the question of if you could design your own school, what would it have in it? That could be an activity with a piece of paper and some colored pencils. You might learn so much drawing with that student about how they would envision um, their own school. Next slide, please. The same thing is true with parents. I'm not suggesting you use all of these questions. Some of these questions you already use. I know you all ask parents about their goals for their child, but I'm encouraging you to look at what goals do you have with, for your child as well as what do you envision your child being able to do in two years because very often those two do not melt. Very often we as parents have goals for our children that are very different from where we envision them being in two years. So um, just, to, just a couple of suggestions to deepen your knowledge um, of the families you work with. Next slide, please. So here's the first harsh transition, really leaving the cuddly spheres of children, youth, and families and heading to procedures. What's interesting about MTSS is that we've had it for decades. Please forgive me, I'm sick of that educational triangle that has all those three tiers on it. I just wanted to just lay it out this way instead. So in our school system, when students are being screened, and, and when we look at screening for tier one services, we're talking about informal screening um, as well as formal, but it could just simply be knowing how many fifth graders need extra help in math or knowing whether you need to schedule more welcoming sessions for students that may need more emotional support. So these universal activities, usually in schools, would cover about 80 to 90 percent of students. They're high quality construction or else they're proactive preventative strategies that are used universally. Tier two, on the other hand, is more targeted. So tier two really looks at five to 15% of the students, but tier two also requires that schools use evidence-based practices, whereas tier one, you don't have to. You can, but you don't have to. So Tier two strategies for a school may be small group interventions, may be um, all kinds of intensive services. The key here is that parents need to be notified with tier two instructional practices. Next slide, please. And tier three, um, where many of our students have been in the past may still be, 
is the most intensive level of support. This is based on assessment, not just screening, but some form of assessment, not a high state um, standard based test, but more a test that looks at where the student is both emotionally and academically. The services are really intense. They are in individual and small groups. Many schools are preferring small groups right now because of the isolation of COVID. They really want to make sure that they can bring students together um, as much as possible. It does require progress monitoring. So in tier three, they look to see how students are progressing and make adaptations and change things to increase student success. It does include parent notifications as well and updates, and it does require evidence-based practices. So you're going to notice MTSS more and more and more in schools. It's certainly going to be used along with screening for recovery services, even though right now it's been with PDIS for a long time and RTI. We're going to see the use of these strategies broadening. There is even a pilot looking at this um, in terms of special ed programs. Next slide, please. So what do you need to know about education? Now, the first thing I want to tell you is that this law, the Elementary and Secondary School Act, is the largest education law in the land, and it provides all kinds of supports for students. So as we look at all of the laws that we're getting ready to slide through, please remember that these services are available to all students. You may know the Elementary Secondary Education Act, the Secondary Education Act as No Child Left Behind. Um, now we know it as Every Student Succeeds Act. Essa, next slide, please. So the first thing I want to um, direct your attention to is the support that ESSA really supplies to our state tribal community. And there are all kinds of services and supports that the state education is um, providing to several different tribes and nations in our state. Uh, it's important to know that they have access to all of these services based on the law, but also based on their particular choices of what they perceive their community to need. Next slide, please. Multilingual education, not bilingual education, multilingual education. Of course, it requires screening and interviews and testing. It identifies students as entering, emerging, transitioning, or expanding English language learning. It is no longer the case that we can just provide English instruction to students. We also have to build upon the family's native language. Um, this is also used to provide language support for students that have an interrupted or inconsistent formal education. There are certain places where formal education um, is not as comprehensive here. So it's important that those students who may be English speaking students get language supports as well. Next slide, please. Students in temporary housing, the McKinney-Vento Act, which is a separate act, but it is housed in ESSA. It's housed in the Every Student Succeeds Act because that's where the funding is. The most important thing that McKinney-Vento does is to identify who is considered homeless. Um, it's really important to know that if, a, if you're working with a family who's living with a relative, they have access to these protections as well. So they are allowed to stay in their existing school. Um, they don't have to change schools. 
there's transportation provided to support these students. And there are materials that you will get later that really go in depth to how these different acts manifest in the lives of our children and families. It's also important to know that McKinney-Vento also covers unaccompanied children and youth, as well as refugee children. Next slide, please. So here we start with the academic intervention components. So grades four through eight are allowed academic intervention services for reading, writing, and math. And these services can look, they can be small great groups, they can be weekend academies, they can be um, extensions of summer schools. There are all kinds of, there, there are some places where teachers will stay at the school one day a week to, to help students. It's important to note, however, that it is MTSS that's going to decide what strategies are needed for which students, even when we're talking about recovery services. Next slide, please. Academic intervention for high school. So for elementary school, the required subjects are reading, writing, and math. For high school, it's any subject that you need for graduation. So academic services are available school-wide, small groups after school. I'm not sure about peer tutoring, um, although the law um, mentions peer tutoring. Right now, we need all students to take care of themselves first. So I would tend to lean towards academic intervention in the form of recovery services before employing peer tutoring at this time. And once again, MTSS will be utilized to decide some of these strategies and for which populations they will employ. Next slide, please. So we mentioned public positive behavior interventions and support. PBIS, we've known this for years, but PBIS, according to the law, a lot of schools may not have had PBIS. Now, schools can use recovery funds to expand PBIS to help students that are having emotional difficulties. What's most important is that the strategies must be evidence-based. And yes, we're talking about that triangle with all three levels once again. Um, but the point is to provide strategies that can help the whole school as well as individual um, students. It's different from mandated counseling. Mandated counseling has specific goals that need to be achieved. This is more at risk counseling support in the school that focuses more on prevention. Next slide, please. RTI, another triangle. Uh, RTI was originally created for grades K through four, and it does provide academic intervention in the form of really rich evidence-based practices. However, it's only right now for K through four because the evidence-based practices are for that particular population. Now it's possible that this can expand, but as you will see, the academic intervention services that I just mentioned can be used in recovery for all grades of students. Next slide, please. So, you know, this was mentioned earlier. This was advertised as a workshop on special ed services. Actually, I should have given you a disclaimer. This is more about you knowing all the services that are available to support students academically and emotionally in the school, not just special ed. So the services that we just mentioned are going to be the core of the recovery efforts that are happening in our, stu in our schools for students both emotionally and academically. 
That's not to say we don't have to delve deeply into special ed services. Of course we do. And we'll start with 504. Next slide, please. So most of us know that Section 504 prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs or activities receiving federal funding. And I just have to take a moment here because although you have people in your districts, in your schools, in your BOCES that are health coordinators to process these requests, I want you to understand that Section 504 has a life beyond our public schools. Section 504 is how college students get to um, receive services and support. Section 504, my favorite story is knowing of a parent that had a five-year-old student that was going to the Y for an after-school program. And the parent mentioned to this um, provider that her child needed transition support when changing from one activity to the next activity. And the Y administrator said, oh, we don't do that. But the Y had a Head Start program that accepted lunch from the United States Department of Agriculture. So that young student had to get the accommodations that he needed. So it, when we talk about 504, it's not just for public schools. And actually it's not just for education, it's for any kind of accommodation that a person needs to participate in an activity with non-disabled peers, providing that that request is made by a medical team and providing that the program accepts federal funding. Um, it is considered a health service because it, there is clearly a limit to one major life activity. In this case, obviously it's education. Next slide, please. So these are some other components. These are some of the services you can request. Now, right now, because of COVID, a lot of students are going to get academic intervention, response to intervention, at-risk counseling because of the COVID experience. But once all of those services go away, what happens if you're working with students who still need those services. You can request those services through a 504 request. The same thing is true for assistive technology. When I, I just wanna take a moment about assistive technology, one thing that is so um, necessary um, is for us to understand not only assistive technology in terms of calculators and voice to text methodologies, but also what about the concept of an FM unit for a student that has ADHD? How many of you have students you're working with who lose focus in the middle of a classroom? How profound would it be for a teacher to say, Susan, we're gonna move to history now. You can stop looking for your math book. <laughs> or whatever it may be, instead of this, the teacher having to, I, I don't want to say yell, but instead of the teacher having to really boisterously get the student's attention, an FM unit might be a wonderful device. Now, normally it has to be requested by a, um, an audiologist, but it can also be requested by a medical team um, who who would then um, be acknowledged by the audiologist to provide this type of technology. Next slide, please. So uh, the process is that there's a medical request or letter that the parent can submit to initiate the process. Every district, county, program, area, 
has a formal packet that needs to be completed for 504. You can get that packet. Most often the special ed team knows how to get the 504 packet, but this packet would be completed by the parent and the student. And, you know, we really need to make sure we're including our high school students in a lot of these requests. And here's the example of some test accommodations, separate location, extended time, um, answers recorded by any means necessary, homework modification. What a wonderful idea. This is not the time for our students to come home with piles of homework. But it's important to know that you can request um, through a 504 for any of these accommodations. I have to take a moment with accessibility needs. Um, I have been transferred to this space to present to you today, but actually I live in a wheelchair. And I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the thousands of students that are in our schools now with various mobility challenges, but I'm so proud they're all over the places. They're running for student government. They are graduating and going to college. And if you have the honor of working with one of these students, of course, you could continue to support them through Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Next slide, please. This is what most of us know, IEPs and IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, actually, I think it was George Bush renamed it, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. I love that, but some, somehow we lost the I. Um, clearly, it ensures that all children with disabilities have access to a free and appropriate public education to meet their unique needs and to prepare them for further education, employment, and independent living. And this is one problem with special education as we know it. This law is wonderful. However, as a society, we have such low expectations for students with special needs. And it's got to be a way to turn that around. We have to find a way to believe in the potentiality of all students, regardless of their disabling conditions, regardless of their challenges. And I, you know, I, I hope as we proceed through this presentation, you will keep that in mind as well. IDA requires that students receive services in a least restrictive environment. And that may be one reason why MTSS is expanding, um, but that does not negate that a special needs student needs what they need. It's not to say that that student has to go all the way up the triangle before they get special needs help before they get the individualized services that they need. Um, but the goal is that students are served in the least restrictive environment. And you know, you can think about things like, we have young, very young children with um, disabling conditions. We have young children with mental health issues. Well, do they have to go to a BOCI school for first grade? Do they have to go to a District 75 school for first grade? Is there a way to give them services and supports in, in a first grade or even a kindergarten um, that can help them to be a part of the broader school community before they are automatically isolated by virtue of their diagnosis into a restrictive setting? It, it's something that we need to start looking, with, looking at. And it also goes along with the concept of low expectations for our students. Um, this law also mandates that schools identify and evaluate students that are suspected of having a disability. So this is the child find function. The best way I can describe this to you is to 
um, share a little story. I was working with a student, a family came to me. The student was um, 20 years old. She um, was struggling. She goes to school every day. She was able to do some reading, but she was never, ever, ever able to pass any kind of tests. Okay, she struggled and struggled and struggled for years. Come to find out that as a second grader, a nail was impaled in her head and she had TBI for decades. And the school didn't provide any kind of support to her. If they just let her languish and languish and languish with no services, no supports, no evaluations, nothing. The family comes to me and the student was 20 and she was turning 21, I think, in, um, I don't know, uh, you know, the, the spring. And this was like February. Well, I had to request an IEP. I had to file an impartial for an impartial hearing. The school says, you know, she's 21 in two months. You know, we, we don't have to do anything. Well, I was able to prove that the school had a responsibility to identify her as a student with disability. And if they had done that, she would have had all of these services in place to help her to achieve. I was able to get compensatory education and special ed services in the form of home instruction, speech and language services, OT and counseling for her at home for three years until she was able to graduate. So the child find function is a really important one for us to pay attention to. Schools have a responsibility to identify and evaluate students that are suspected of having a disability. That's not the same as dumping students into special ed. It's actually looking at the data. It's actually looking at student performance to determine who might need special ed services and supports. Next slide, please. So this is the, the process for getting an IEP. I apologize that 60 calendar days should be up higher on the screen, but the request for a referral for an IEP, the consent must be obtained within 10 days from a referral to request or if somebody else, like a social worker from outside, makes the referral, a copy of that referral has to be provided to the parent within 10 days. The process starts the date the parent consents for an evaluation, and from consent to evaluation is 60 calendar days. From consent to the arrangement of services and supports is 60 school days. I know it's confusing, but 60 school days is, you know, obviously a, a, a bit longer. You will have information to refer back to this um, that I will go through when we get to the resources. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So for initial IEP, these are the components of an evaluation. I only want to stress two things. A comprehensive eye exam is so important. Now, the physical that the school requires may not need a comprehensive eye exam, a hearing test, or lab work. But it is important for families to have this information about their children. You know, I had a student who was in a gifted program. He was doing well, initially when he got into the program and then he started having behavioral challenges and a psychiatrist contacted us and said, um, you know, put this student in a BOCES room, put him in District 75 and I said, no. And I looked at his data and there was something about his perceptual functioning. I sent him for a comprehensive eye exam. This young student, this young gifted student needed bifocals. So, to say that that's important, and and subsequently, once he was able to see, um, a lot of those behaviors changed, and some of them were completely resolved. 
So a hearing test is important, lab work, we know lab work. Not only is lab work important because we have hyperactive students that may have thyroid conditions, but we also have students on medications that require lab work. So when you're working with families, it's important to make sure that they have this information and they have these records. The evaluation can also include private evaluations of functional behavior assessment, as well as a psychiatric, a neuropsychological, a developmental evaluation. I do not like giving discharge or intake documents as part of the evaluation process because there's a lot of information on there that schools don't need to have. Next slide, please. So every year, once the IEP is in place, there's an annual review. And here are some of the things that um, you, know, you want to look at. The strengths of the student, the concerns of the parent. These are the components that an IEP team needs to look at. But again, they need to look at the possibility that the student um, you know, needs to be in the least restrictive environment if they're not there already. Next slide, please. These are the services. Now, these services are different in districts. In some districts, they call resource room a service. That same service in New York City is called SETS, Special Ed Teacher Support Services. There's direct services to students or indirect services to teachers to help them learn how to manage a classroom, for example, with a special needs child that has a behavioral challenge. Someplace else that may be called consultant teachers. And then there are all related services, which initially when the laws were first formed were related to the student's classification. So counseling, speech and language, and then there's special education instruction and transition services. Just a moment regarding transition services. So transition services happen usually when a student enters high school. There's a transition plan that's supposed to be monitored and developed every year. Um, this is such an important service that we very often don't get right. Um, but I also want to mention that when you look at IEPs, there are four IEPs. There's the initial IEP, the annual review IEP. There's also an IEP for decertification. When a student no longer needs special ed services, you don't just stop. You get a decertification IEP because then some of the services are tapered off. And finally, there's an exit IEP which obviously um, is part of the transition planning for the high school student. Next slide, please. And then there's special settings. Oh, thank you so much. So this is just some of the extra supports. Paras, paras are considered supplemental education supports extended to school year, homework, classroom modifications. All of these are possible to have on an IEP along with test accommodations. Next slide, please. So special education, those are services. This slide details special ed settings. So you can have a special class, right, in a school, but that's a 12 to one, 12 students, one teacher, or 15 to one for high school. It could be a completely specialized school in a BOSIS program. Um, when we talk about home instruction, I have to spend a moment here because most of the time home instruction does not require an IEP. And I'm not talking about homeschooling. Homeschooling is when parents apply to homeschool their child and they submit a plan to the district and that's approved by the state. Home instruction is to provide instruction for children who cannot go to school. So students that have cancer, horrific diseases like that. Um, now, after COVID, home instruction will be in-person and or remote. 
Now, a lot of people are talking about, can we get home instruction if our student doesn't want to go to school? You know, there are districts that are now detailing what disorders are necessary for students to meet the criteria for medical necessity to have remote learning at home. Uh, in terms of phobia and students that don't want to go to school, it requires work to build that case. It is not automatically included. It requires probably a comprehensive plan, maybe some um, the inclusion of some cognitive behavioral therapy or some intensive therapy so that the school system can see what the plan is as opposed to just providing um, remote instruction hospital, partial hospitalization, um, day programs and residential programs. Next slide, please. So now we're going to go to COVID. So we started with looking at the students and looking at the families. You started by thinking about the families that you're working with right now and what some of their previous experiences might have been both at home and in school. And then we took this journey through the words of education law to find out what was available to help students during the recovery or what was available to help students without special ed, just to help all students generally. And then we took a right turn through special education. And now we're going to go back and look at what are the responses to the pandemic that the school systems are generating. Next slide, please. So long COVID has been identified by the CDC as a post COVID condition. And uh, just in July, guidance came from both the Section 504 and the Individuals with Disabilities Education mm -hmm. Act um, components of our education department. And this guidance identified these particular behaviors that may impact student learning. Now, just as we talked about home instruction for students with phobia, it's clear that it's possible that for a student to have a COVID response, just an intense anxiety that prohibits them from leaving their house, um, it might not be related to the student having had COVID, um, but still, um, I think I think the case is there to use COVID as a reason to get the services that the student might need um, while they are getting mental health services and comprehensive mental health services with youth um, that are involved to help them through. We have a whole group of peers that are helping youth throughout our state. So when you think about phobia, um, I think it is possible, but you want to make sure that you really build the case for it. It's not just going to be a matter of the student has anxiety, he's going on remote instruction. And similarly, what's interesting about these particular conditions I'm looking at these and I'm wondering, okay, so what services does the student need? And that's the interesting component that's, that is not in this guidance. And I think that for that to be clear, we may have to consult with rehab therapists or occupational therapists, or to get more of an understanding of how we can provide service interventions to help these students through time. Next slide, please. So for this long COVID condition, it is a child find process. Schools are required to identify, locate, and evaluate all infants and toddlers um, who may need early intervention. They certainly are 
um, required to find students with disabilities um, that may need services and supports. And I think now we have something like 200,000 students in America who have had COVID. So this long COVID um, disorder is really going to change service delivery in our school system through Section 504 and through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. 504, there may be some accommodations that are necessary for all of those conditions. The challenge I think for us is going to be identifying what do students need because of long COVID. And that is not in the guidance. And by the way, there's a copy of the guidance included in these slides. Next slide, please. So remember those students I told you to think about, the students that you work with? So think about the students that you know who did not have school difficulty, never had school problems. Those students, they may now have academic deficits that require extra help. They may have difficulties getting along with others and may have difficulty staying on track. We don't know. They may need school-based academic intervention. They may need at-risk counseling. They may need English language supports. We know that multilingual students, um, many of them have lost a certain degree of the English proficiency that they gained during COVID. Um, probably because they were home and speaking in their native language. So it's important to think about all of these things that a student who did not have difficulty before COVID may need. Next slide, please. So the students that you know who had academic difficulty, they may show missed remote instruction and attendance, okay? and attendance is going to be an issue this year, um, um, no matter what. I, I don't think there's any getting around that, but um, this student who had academic difficulty in the past may show avoidant behaviors in the classroom, maybe because of certain subjects or situations, they may have significant academic loss, making it difficult for them to catch up. They might be moody, just moodiness. How many of us are experiencing moodiness as a result of COVID? But the point is that they may need these services and supports. And, and go to the next slide, please. The same thing is true for students that you're working with who have behavior difficulties. They may be exhibiting certain behaviors that required them to have more school-based counseling or PBIS if it's available, or they may need a functional behavior assessment or academic intervention. Maybe some of their behaviors are being triggered by academic deficits, but they also might need a section 504 or they may need special ed services. Next slide, please. So for the students who already had a 504 plan that you're working with, obviously any student with any condition may show any of these behaviors or difficulties. But in the case of a student with a 504 plan, you must have make sure that you're paying attention to whether the plan expired or whether it's still in place. If the plan is still in place, then you really want to help the family and the student identify what it is they need help with. It may be that the existing 504 plan can stay in place and some of the other services that we talked about through MTSS can help the student. But if the 504 plan has to be updated, then obviously, you would start that process. I'm, I'm concerned that sometimes we try to do everything at once 
And I think the most important thing is to make sure that our students are comfortable to get them in school, to, to, to make sure that they are able to find pleasure going to school, that they're reestablishing relationships, maybe even students that were previously socially um, delayed, for lack of a better word, they might even they might even come back to school and be more social than they were before COVID. So my point is, if the 504 is expired, of course you want to start to take steps to reactivate it and update it. If the 504 plan is still in effect, then let's see, give yourself, give the family, most of all, give the student time to see how they're doing in school and time to see exactly what they need for the next plan. Next slide, please. So it's similar with, with um, the IEP. So for your students that previously had an IEP, they may have missed a lot of services and we're gonna talk about compensatory education in a second. They may have significant difficulty adjusting to the classroom processes information. So it's really important to see where they are and to make a determination about whether they need compensatory services. Again, I wouldn't rush for a brand new evaluation. I would really try to encourage all of us to let our students be able to go to school and breathe, you know, before we start the evaluation process. Who knows how long the screening is going to take? So that does not negate the fact that the student may need an updated IEP. I'm just saying that it doesn't have to be done the first or second week of school. Next slide, please. So the students that you're just meeting, of course, they may need all of these services as well. Um, and that may be easier for you as a clinician. It may be more challenging for you as a clinician. But the point is that our students' needs are going to be huge as they return to school. And I think it's so important that we, you know, give them time while pursuing the strategies that they need long-term, like an updated IEP um, or 504 plan. And while they are utilizing some of the recovery services that are in place for students with emotional and or behavioral and or learning difficulties. Next slide, please. So just a word about compensatory education. These are services that are given to students because they were denied appropriate services in the past. Like the story that I told you about the high school st student, that's one cadre. They're also given to students now, and this is state education language regarding compensatory instruction in response to COVID. But they're also being given now um, to students so that they can make appropriate progress in light of their circumstances, including any loss of skills that occurred as a result of a student not receiving education or services due to school closures. Now, you remember in the beginning, I spoke about schools looking at students' strengths? Well, we have to help families to also be able to look at the challenges that students have now that may be a result of their COVID experience. Okay. But in terms of compensatory education, there are resources there to give students who have suffered um, academic loss as a result of COVID to give them extra help. Compensatory instruction is predominantly for students 
that have disabilities. Recovery services are for all students. Next slide, please. So here are some of the things you need for compensatory education. It's not just a matter of going in there and saying we need compensatory education. Families have to collect data. How long was school closed? What method of instruction did the student receive? Some students had paper packets. Other students had remote learning. What classes, what instruction, particularly with high school students, what, what were the classes that they were trying to complete during COVID? What were the dates and times of remote learning? Was there a remote special education plan? These were temporary plans created by districts to make sure that students were receiving certain services because they couldn't receive all the services on their IEP because of the pandemic. So to look at that remote education plan and to see the services the student was supposed to receive, you know, and were those services provided? And then are there changes in the student's progress? Is there evidence of student regression? And these are some of the responses, you know, is to determine the missed instruction, to identify the services that were missed, and to look at what's the best remedy um, between extended day programs and compensatory education. So an extended day program can give you more instruction, but not necessarily replace the services that were missed. So it's also important to determine if the student needs a revised IEP because of everything they lost during COVID. Now, that may sound different from what I just stated earlier about waiting before you do the IEP. But here's the distinction. If a student is returning to school and they've missed a lot of instruction and you need to apply for compensatory education services, well, those compensatory education services would be a part of a revised IEP. So if a family is not going to be seeking compensatory services to replace what was lost. These are special needs families, only students with IEPs and 504s. If the family is not going to be seeking compensatory instruction, right, you may want to wait to do the IEP, use the recovery services that are in place, use the other school supports that are in place, and then determine um, whether the IEP needs to be evaluated at that moment or whether the IEP can be really um, revised during its regular annual review date. So if the family is seeking compensatory instruction and is awarded compensatory instruction, the IEP would have to be revised because that's where that entitlement is going to be located. I hope that's clear. Next slide, please. And these are some of the options. So extended school year is one option. Um, um, an extended school year means nine months. There are some students. I don't think there are any of the students we work with, but there are some students that have horrific disabling conditions that required a structural learning environment for up to 12 months. Um, and. I, I, I mean horrific. I, I met a student um, at an assistive technology conference. There was one young student who was showing how she communicates with her cards. There was a high school student that was preparing for a regents exam that talked about how she was able to, to learn um, and communicate with her eyes um, that were connected to a laptop. Um, that was also connected to her wheelchair. And then there was another student who came in on a stretcher with a nurse and attendant, her parents. She had a whole team. 
And she told us, she was verbal, and she told us how she used just this little finger to navigate on her laptop for learning. Amazing. If I ever find this video, because this was videoed, it was absolutely amazing. But that's the type of student that would need more uh, of a 12 month approach to instruction, not um, the students that we generally work with, but students that have horrific conditions, um, students that have complicated uh, medical conditions. Also, if the student requires a significant period of time to review what happened, remember we used to talk about the summer slide? Well, now we have the COVID slide. So if a student requires a significant period of review in the beginning of the school year to reestablish and maintain their IEP goals and objectives, you know, if, if, that's, if that period is too long, then compensatory instruction would be helpful to resolve it. Next slide, please. So now what? Now, you have all this information. You have your families. You have your skills. You have the knowledge of the law. Where do you begin? Next slide, please. So these are your tools, student and parent preferences, little bits of that saffron. Remember, we mentioned the essential knowledge, making sure students have working devices Transcripts, you cannot help a high school student without transcripts. Now, ninth grade students very often don't have transcripts because very often ninth grade students don't go to school. That transition from middle school is very difficult. Sometimes ninth graders go to school buildings, but they may not necessarily be in their class. Um, you're gonna need report cards, progress notes, IEPs, evaluations, knowledge of the school district, Go to your school district's website, see what's where, what are they talking about? What, what are recovery services looking like in your district? And also familiarity with the school services and supports that your school district is offering. Meaning you wanna look at that website and see how all of the services that are detailed in those educational laws are existing in your particular um, area of New York State. Next slide, please. So, where to begin? She does not look happy, but she's outside. So we know she's gonna take the mask off and she's probably gonna play the mess out of that saxophone. Anyway, where do we begin? Oh, with student strengths before COVID. Where are students now? What are their strengths now? What are their challenge? What are their goals? What are the parents' goals? Remember, those very often are not congruent. So the idea of really listening to students' goals and parents' goals to find out how it is you're going to help this family to get what they need, that may be a significant component of your work. You're gonna have your educational tools, familiarity with schools and services. You may have some possible strategies that we listed on the slides. Your knowledge and your support is key. You bring to this family, to this school, to our state, a wealth of knowledge um, and support that helps so many families every day and every year. Also your partnership with the family, you know, you have to put that in there. And also the parents partnership with their school. That's another really important component. And the last thing, so when you look at these things and you put them together, you can get to school success even after COVID. There's also one other thing I want to say before I go to questions. Um, it's really, it's really important to be in contact with the medical team, or at least if you're not in contact with the medical team, make sure the parent 
has a medical team for this student in case you need them as you're fighting for um, services and resources. Next slide, please. So these are some of the resources that you'll be able to review. There's the August 24th guidance and this return to school roadmap. These are all uh, United States Department of Education documents um, that would be very helpful um, for you to refer to. Um, some of the documents regarding long COVID are included in these resources. Next slide, please. The New York State Education Department, the Health and Safety Guide. I put here the Commissioner's Regulation Part 200. There is a parent's guide for special ed, but it hasn't been updated since 2003, and it's really complicated. The Commissioner's Reg, we think regulations, no, it's very simple. There's an index, you look up the page, you find the page, and the information is there. I think that's a much friendlier document to use to get a sense of any question you have regarding special ed services in New York State. Um, there are some SF fact sheets for families, and there's also a English language learners guide for parents. I also included the IEP homepage. Now, the IEP homepage has a blank IEP, but it also has a blank IEP in like seven languages. So that's really something great to have. Next slide, please. These are all the resources regarding McKinney-Vento. Um, most of them are through New York State um, Teach. And these are very, very helpful for anybody who's working with students in temporary housing. And last but not least, last slide, please. Families, parent advocates, my community, our support. Um, not that you can't do it alone, you can, um, but also it's important to connect parents with other parents. So these New York State Parent Information Resource Centers, they are federally funded to support families. There's always families together, we know, of course. Um, and there are also family support offices inside the OMH field support offices that might be helpful. And I put Families on the Move of New York City here, um, not only because I'm a part of them, and somebody just said Parent to Parent is a wonderful resource. You're correct. I am sorry that they're not on this list. My colleagues will not speak to me for at least a week because they're not on this list. But Families on the Move is here because their advocates work inside the children's mental health hospitals. They are in hospital settings. And sometimes their information is very helpful for parents wherever you are in the state regarding um, hospital experiences for students that are experiencing severe psychiatric um, difficulties. You know, we always have to remind ourselves that suicide is still prevalent, too prevalent. Um, in our society. Next slide, please. Questions and answers. I'm ready. Great. Um, thank you so much, Roselia. Um, uh, of course, a lot of information and, and you have such deep knowledge of the educational system and educational advocacy. I know we did get some questions in, so I'm going to share some of those with you. Um, some of those I think you've answered already, but I just want to sort of put out to folks that as you as as we wait and as you have questions, what I want you to think about, I know you know our audience is mostly mental health providers. So for you all in the audience, I want you to think about any children that children or youth that you work with who have mental health challenges or mental health difficulties and and you're working with, who you have concerns about with regards to educational needs. And so if you have specific kind of um, situations or uh, circumstances that you're dealing with, or addressing um, around the, the children that you work with, please feel free. Uh, Roselia is an amazing educational advocate and might be able to give you some ideas and feedback um, and thoughts about how to proceed. With regards to some of the questions that have come through, 
I think you've answered some of these. Um, one of the questions that, that came through um, is um, about um, uh, anxiety. And I know you addressed the issue of anxiety um, and, and you talked a little bit about that with regards to remote learning um, and, um, and, and getting services. Um, I wanted to know if you can talk a little bit more about that because um, the question, let me just see if I can find it. Would generalized anxiety disorder be a potential qualifier for home instruction for a child with an IEP? So I know you talked a little bit about anxiety disorders and what that means. And I, I, I wanted to sort of focus on that question because um, I, I do anticipate that questions around um, transitioning back to school, especially with kids with anxiety disorders and adjusting and being able to come back. And, and for some kids with anxiety disorders, uh, the, the, you know, the pandemic could have been a blessing in disguise and make it real difficult for, for those kids to transition back. So if you could say a little bit more about that, again, and a generalized anxiety disorder as a potential qualifier for home instruction for a okay. child with an IEP. Thank you. So in most districts, districts are determining what medical conditions qualify students to receive remote instruction um, because of that medical condition. So all districts have a list of what is what they consider to be medical necessity. Now, what what they say in my districts, and I'm sure what they're thinking in other districts is that that's not a closed door. It doesn't mean that somebody else cannot apply to have remote instruction because of a severe um, mental health illness, including general anxiety. What it does mean, however, is that we need to be able to make a request that determines what is, what is the malfunction? What is the difficulty that the student is having? How does that generalized anxiety interfere with learning? Okay, is that general anxiety manifesting because they won't leave the school, the, the house, okay? Is that, is that manifesting because they won't go to school, but they'll go and play basketball with their friends. Or so the, the answer to this question means that you have to do two things. One, you have to be able to detail how the general generalized anxiety interferes with the student participating with the learning processes in the school and to be able to detail that. Okay, and then you also need to be able to talk about what mental health components, if you're given remote learning, what mental health components are you going to add to the student's life to help them to transition back to school? So the answer to your question is yes, it could be, but it really requires a comprehensive request um, probably under a 504 process um, to get that kind of remote instruction from your district. I should also say that the state is, is not advocating remote instruction at all, but school districts are acknowledging um, that there are students with medical needs that will be entitled to remote instruction. I hope that answers the question. Uh, no, thank you, Roselia. Um, and I think it does, and I think it's a, it's going to be a major issue for those of you who are working with children with anxiety disorders and school related, especially obviously school related anxiety, separation anxiety, and and older kids who have uh, you know anxiety disorders and depression. Who can I say one say thing? Um, in the past, a lot of our students with mental health issues were on home instruction. Um, maybe because they're waiting for placements or because, um, you know, as part of their treatment, it was really common. This is really going to require that we use that student's current functioning, where they are academically, what they are experiencing, what's holding them back, what has gotten worse because of COVID, 
how that manifests. So it's not just a little script like we may have done in the past. It really is a cohesive pa package that looks at um, the student's experiences in detail, along with a comprehensive mental health plan to transition them back to school. Right. Okay. Um, there are there there are great questions coming in. Let me see if I can find another one. Um, oh yeah. So I, I think you talked a little bit about the the current services that are available. Um, as you were talking about the resources that are available for parents. Um, and I, so there's a question that came in. Do you have any resources? And I know you gave a good list of them uh, or recommendations for parents to advocate for their children or support groups for parents of children with disabilities. At um, our early learning center, we have many children with IFSPs and IEPs, but the providers don't always come to the site, especially now with COVID. It's hard to support parents in advocating for these services. Um, so, yeah, I, what what sort of thoughts do you have about that? Um, so, so that yeah. services having happening remotely um, in my team, we provide support groups in um, Queens and in the Bronx. There are many different programs that are providing support groups. So it really depends on your zip code, where you're located. Um, the resources that I listed on the back, any one of them can point you to a support group for parents that's occurring virtually. So if you, um, you know, if you are in New York, you can certainly contact me and I can tell you where those support groups would be. Um, you can also contact the field support offices, but a lot of us are providing support groups virtually. Um, and it's tricky because we have to maintain confidentiality and use certain protocols, but yes. Yeah. You know, um, Roselia, you, you talked a little bit about timing. And so I, I heard you talk about the co the complexity. And I, I think on the one hand, you were saying give give kids some time uh, to see kind of what's going on. But you also gave the example in some cases where you may need to intervene immediately. For example, if a kid did have an IEP, a student did have an IEP, and you know there are some needs that weren't met. But in general, what if, 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 and, and this is the thing I do see, you know, these mental health, I, I do see a pending mental health crisis coming in, new kids coming in, needing or having mental health challenges and difficulties that can impact um, education. Um, for, for those kids, um, as, as well as for kids who may have already been working with the folks on this call, how long would you give? Uh, setting aside that example of the kid with the IEP who maybe wasn't getting services and you need to advocate immediately, um, what, how much time would you give um, to sort of see how things play out with, get, with kids with mental health needs and, and sort of then moving into making referrals when needed? To tell you the truth, Jim, I would make a list with the parent what are what are the students' behaviors that you're noticing the first day of school? How was that experience? Maybe even before school to have a list so that in a period of time you have something to compare it to because the answer to your question comes from the student. <laughs> you know, there's some students that when I say give time, I'm saying that you think that the first week of school, um, if that student missed a lot of special ed services, you would go right to the compensatory education track. That doesn't mean that that student's not gonna have access to all of the recovery services that are occurring both for students with emotional problems and um, and academic problems. Similarly, if a student goes back to school and they're getting recovery services and they're in at-risk counseling and it's not enough and they're given PBIS, um, more intense services, that does not stop a parent from updating the IEP at that time. So the answer to your question is, first have a sense of how the student is doing the first couple of weeks of school. 
maybe even engage the student in dialogue about the, the school experience. Okay. And then look over time and see what's progressing, what's not progressing. You don't want to wait too long. And here's one other key thing. Any parent that has a 504 plan or an IEP, you should ask that parent, when is that IEP supposed to be reviewed? It could be that the student has an IEP coming in meeting coming in December. So there's no reason to intervene. You can just prepare for December. It could be that the 504 plan is intact until February. Well, there you may have to intervene because maybe the student needs more supports than what the recovery services are providing. Did I answer your question? I, I don't know. I think so. Sort of whoever whoever asked that question, please chat in. Uh, Roselia, actually, I need you to give a quick answer and then we need to close. But I, I say this because this is um, one uh, question and I'll, I'll make this the last one. Um, and and I, your answer is if you can give it in like what's the one thing someone can do? What is the best way to assist a parent who is struggling with the school to request remote learning? And I would actually just broaden that out. You know, it, what is one thing that that you could suggest to parents uh, to these providers to do and, and advocate or support their parents to do that one step that they can take? I would suggest that they contact, I would suggest that they contact a skilled parent advocate like me in their community to help them fight for remote learning. And I will say that the battle for remote learning is not over yet. The Regents meetings are next week. Like I said, education is fluid. Who knows, we may not have to have these discussions. But the one thing I would say is to find help for that parent, somebody yes. to work alongside of her. For him. Thank you so much, Roselia. Um, and, and if anyone does want Roselia's contact information, contact us and then we'll, we'll give you the, uh, the best contact information for Roselia. Just very quickly, we have a couple of upcoming CTAC events you see here. Why worry helping children experiencing anxiety disorders? I know a few folks had questions about anxiety disorders, so you may want to attend that one. And uh, we've all been affected. A conversation about collective trauma um, at the end of September um, that I'll be leading. And then very quickly, thank you again. If you have any requests for information or Roselia, please uh, 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 contact us at ctac.info at NY. Uh, u.edu, and then also um, visit our website at www.ctechny.org uh, for any past trainings or to sign up for new trainings and, um, and get information. But thank you all for your participation today, and we hope this has been helpful. Um, and thank you, Roselia, for a wonderful presentation and information that we hope will help you all in your work moving forward with children, youth, and families. Thank you.